And thank you all for showing up today to hear about what, we've, what I've been working on for about a year and a half and what all my co-conspirators, who I list after my name and year, have been really working on for three to four years. And so I'm really building all, on top of a lot of products that have been in the works for a good while now. And I also just wanted to draw attention to that photo um, that you see at the background of my title slide that also happens to be the background to the Southwest Fire Science Consortium 2016 fire report. And that's because this photo shows the Juniper Fire, uh, which was a 31,000 acre managed fire on the Tonto National Forest that is currently being held up as probably one of the most successful burns um, in an area that it's not used to doing a lot of managed fire um, in recent memory. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig into that a bit and show uh, that as a case study for some of the work that we're applying. So without further ado, I'll just get into the talk. And I think it's a pretty important topic because the, the key that I'm leading off here is linking these two often stovepiped concepts. This idea of operational fire response, which is typically considered a an emergency management response that um, has its own incident command structure. And then we have this kind of old school, archaic, 700 page planning document based landscape management idea. And bringing those two things together is something that people have talked about for decades now. And it's been really hard to try and bring those two audiences that are working on those two different sides of forest management to the same table. And so to dig into that a little more, I want to start by kind of just looking at the mission of the U.S. Forest Service and to understand the context of where the money goes and what, how that translates into how the Forest Service actually functions. I want to focus with this first little quotation at the top, and that's that the mission of the USDA Forest Service is to sustain healthy, diverse, and productive forests and grasslands to meet the needs of present and future generations. And so I thought, okay, of course, the Forest Service is designed to keep those forests going for the general public today and well into the future. But it seems like everyone's talking about the U.S. Fire Service because there's all this money that's going into fire. So I did a quick word search, and I said, where in the mission statement does it mention fire? And if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the phrase is not found. There's no mention of fire on the U.S. Forest Service mission statement whatsoever. So carrying that into budgeting, we look at how has money been spent in the Forest Service over the last five years. And what I'm highlighting right here is wildfire management money. Um, and you'll notice those numbers are pretty big compared to everything around them. In fact, uh, they're about double any other expenditure on the U.S. Forest Service. And depending on what metric you use, if you look at where those expenditures have gone over the last five years, we're looking at anywhere from a 60 to a 71% increase in funding specifically on fire. So if we're getting all of this money pouring into fire, where is it coming from? Well, you'll notice over here, every other program in the Forest Service, aside from land acquisition, that little LA over there, is suffering. Um, all that money has to come from somewhere, and it's coming from these other programs. But we, as ecologists, understand that fire is not a separate component of the forest. It's actually integral. It's a process that drives all of the other functions within the forest. So how do we get some of that money that's currently being spent on wildfire management and use it to actually enrich the ecological processes and the, the land use processes, the campers, the hikers, all those other things that make our forest what they are? So that's what we're trying to do is, well, basically just follow the money. What if we leveraged fire response to actually get where we want to go? If that's where the money's coming in, how do we use that? So it's nice we have this handy structure already in front of us. The cohesive strategy already talks about these three overarching goals. And if we are currently massively funding wildfire response, we can figure out how we can use that to restore and maintain resilient landscapes and to create these fire adaptive communities that allow us to have people living in these forests, but also have these forests adapted to what's probably coming down the pipeline. So the challenge we're dealing with here is aligning these public expectations. These are, unfortunately, the people living near and in the forest, and also the constituents um, who fund the purse strings for our forest service uh, funding. Um, 
they're the ones who, are, who have expectations. Well, everybody has these expectations that when you have a fire program, you need to protect life, you need to protect the resources, and you need to protect the assets that you care about on that landscape. So that's a real challenge to make sure that you're, you're trying to balance some of these ecological components with the real reason why we even have a fire system in our forest. And so, unfortunately, if you go back to that mission statement, the agency's mission is not to do those things outright. Those are kind of subcontexts. They're expected, and that's actually where all the money goes. But what the forest, is, the forest Service is supposed to be doing is adapting to the current situation and what's likely to be coming down the pipeline if we're talking about climate change, uh, urban encroachment, all these other things. How does the Forest Service adapt? Um, accountability. When we pour money in to any of these programs, we need to be able to trace that money. We need to understand what the bang for the buck that's coming out of spending $2 billion in 2016 on firefighting. Are we getting a good payoff? Is there a good return there? Uh, understanding that you know, humans have lived with fire for, what, 250,000 years as our species, long before that as our progenitors. If we are a fire-adapted species, why have we become so fire-averse in the last century? Maybe it's time we get back to understanding that fire is actually a process that we have evolved to live with. And so it's a big part of that, it's using fire as that keystone process to help us create manageable, sustainable forests that, that meet all those other objectives. So that's the idea. That it's bringing together that challenge. And it's not easy. Uh, conceptually, uh, Matt Thompson had a paper that came out in 2016 that's been based on some work he developed with fire managers in the Southern Sierras landscapes, where it's overlaying this idea of the objectives for what the planning process is, but understanding that they are spatially diverse across the landscape. And when you have a fire ignition, it's really important what is next to what and what is threatened by that fire and what's likely to benefit from that fire. So they put together this basic framework where they're trying to zone landscapes, first of all, by their tolerance of fire, whether they're likely to benefit or they're likely to be harmed by a fire given the, the likely conditions that will burn. Then uh, move to these flexible operational units that allow them to manage fire and summarize that risk. And then ideally, ongoing through the planning process before a fire even starts, and then also hopefully while uh, plans are being made after an ignition, we have this consistent feedback of science that allows us to see how risk is changing with conditions on the ground, be that fire weather, proximity to things we care about, uh, any of those other kinds of concepts. So digging into this a little bit more, uh, we look at this wildfire management continuum, and it's a spatial continuum. You can imagine this laying over any given landscape where we have some part of the landscape that's likely to benefit from fire. That's the blue area in the lower right corner. Those are areas um, where typically we're trying to restore fire to the system. But oftentimes, proximally, they're located, uh, both, or spatially, I should say, they're located next to things we care about that are sensitive to fire. Um, we have wildland urban in interface. Um, we have a lot of threatened endangered species and, and their habitats that oftentimes don't benefit from fire Excuse me, early on. Um, but if they're a fire adapted species, maybe after a year or two, they actually see a rebound. And you imagine if you actually get an ignition in a specific location, oftentimes you're spreading across these different objectives. So you get a start in a resource objective area, but eventually you're going to spread towards a protective objective area. So it's really important to understand these objectives have to be dynamic and they have to be t tailored to the conditions of that, maybe that three to five day forecast. But a lot of this stuff can be pre-gamed. We can already understand what the risks are or the benefits are to a lot of the things we care about on our landscape before we ever get an ignition. And so how we fit this all together is in this framework that we show here, starting in the upper left-hand corner, we start with a risk assessment. We look at what are the things we care about in the landscape and how are they likely to respond to fire. Then we run some fire simulations and figure out how likely the things we care about are even likely to burn, and if they burn, what's the intensity that that's actually likely to happen. And then we take that information, move it over to the right there into our spatial fire planning. And so that, that way we actually can see what's the likelihood of the things we care about burning and what's their response. Then we start to break up um, a continuous surface of that information in, and summarize it into polygons 
um, that allow us to summarize within this area, we're likely to have a benefit. Within that area, we're likely to have a negative consequence. And we decided to create those polygons around defensible features with on, on the landscape, defensible areas where fire managers could actually go in and potentially alter fire behavior if they chose to. In the lower left-hand corner here, we're looking at mapping responder safety. That's an ongoing process and another series of tools that we're hoping to roll out in the next year or so. So I'm not going to talk about that a whole lot, um, but that's something that we think maps onto this really nicely. And then lastly, those all tie together into response decision support. So how do you come up with your strategic objectives prior to the fire? And then when you have an ignition happening, you've already figured out why you would engage, whether you get engage at all, how you would probably do it safely and effectively, and where that you're most likely to have success. And what's great about that is that you can then communicate all of those decisions to the public and to your other stakeholders so that when fire slops over out of your ownership, fire will move into a, another ownership and people will understand what's going on in terms of decisions that, that are being made both locally and at a regional scale. So starting with this process, kind of stepping you through it, we start with this risk assessment. And risk of fire, it's not a positive or a negative, it's just the likelihood that something's going to happen. And it's this combination of whether it's going to happen, when it happens, how intense is it going to be, and then what are the potential effects of that intensity. And often that's a biological system that, that determines the actual effects. So you take this risk, um, combine those three components, and you can come up with a, a diagram that looks a bit like this. So for each of the things we care about, the highly valued resources and assets in the upper left-hand corner here, we're looking at the risk on, onto each of those things. And what we're doing is, first of all, these are located spatially on a landscape, so we can burn that landscape using a, a fire spread simulator like um, the FSIM program. Um, FSIM allows us to figure out how likely any particular area on a landscape is likely to burn and under what intensity under uh, historical weather conditions. Once we have a sense of if something's going to burn, we can put together a response function that tells us under, say, flame length one, it's the thing we care about is likely to respond this way, under flame length two, that way, all the way up to flame length six, where chances are it'll probably have a negative response if you have really high flame length. Most things don't like that. Once you have all of those kind of balls in the air, then you start to weigh which of the things, which of these things you care about do you care about the most, which of these things can go further down on the list. And so you actually put your weighting in, and that allows you to start to make decisions based on what your priorities are at the time. So when you look at the key components that are going into it conceptually, we are looking at the likelihood and intensity of wildfire and combining that with the things that we care about, where they are, how they're likely to respond to fire. Then once we have those two things together, we look at which of those is the most important and which of the, those things is the most abundant and numerous on the landscape, and we can start to put those concepts together. If you want to actually do this, I'm not going to go through this whole diagram here. I'm really just going to focus on um, this part here. We have a series of inputs that allow us to do the fire modeling. We run that FSIM modeling, um, and what it, the outputs that we care about are burn probability and fire intensity. Those give us a clue of what our potential hazard is at any given point on the landscape. Then, moving into component two here, we look at the things we care about on the landscape. Um, we get a bunch of smart heads together. Ideally, we've got uh, line officers and resource specialists who can tell us how the things we care about are likely to respond to fire. And what that does is allows us to develop this wildfire risk for any of the individual things we care about. And then we integrate those two components together um, by weighting what is the most important thing we care about, what's the least important thing on our landscape, and then we just apply that weighting scheme to it. So, for example, here's the Tonto National Forest, and here are some of the highly valued resources and assets that we care about. And they're distributed on here. I haven't tried to label them, but it gives you a sense that there's they're kind of stippled throughout the landscape. Uh, some of them are ecological things. Some of them are infrastructure. Um, some of them are just land ownership boundaries. Um, and so these are all things that we pay attention to when we're developing these response functions. Uh, this is what these functions oftentimes look like. If you have, say, a fire-adapted ecosystem, you can imagine when you have a, a low-intensity fire, 
you oftentimes get a positive value. Uh, that positive value means that your system is likely to benefit from a fire at any of those flame lengths. Um, but even our most fire adapted systems, when you get into, say, a crown fire situation, you will sometimes have negative effects that happen. Um, and so it's important to understand that too. Fire susceptible infrastructure is typically the case, and for that we're looking at hardened things like uh, power lines or, or gas pipelines. They don't ever benefit from fire, but oftentimes they can tolerate quite a bit of fire. And then lastly, we have things like um, private infrastructure. Homes uh, pretty much always have some kind of a negative response to fire, be it a slight negative response or an extreme negative response. And then when we get down to the weighting of the things they care about, um, this is the kind of thing that you can share with the public. This is the kind of thing where you can get input and decide what the forest should be putting most of its, uh, where it should be putting its eggs and the things that it cares about the most. Here, for example, watershed quality is a big deal uh, because on the national forest, that water is going to feed Phoenix. And so they put a lot of importance on watersheds, ecosystem functions, and of course, where people are living. And so you can see that there's this kind of weighting scheme that happens that allows us to dial in the risk on a landscape. Last thing, I'm not going to go into this, but something that we do think about when we're looking at these, the fire modeling is understanding where risks are coming from and where they're likely to spread to. And so you can look at the distribution of historical lightning strikes in an area or ignitions, but if they're human ignitions as well, and see when you get an ignition in this location, where is it likely to spread? On this image right here, those red areas, that's right around the city of Payson. So typically, when you have a fire outside the area, um, what you see is fires tend to spread into Payson. So when you have fires in those areas, you need to be careful about spread towards the things we care about, typically human habitation and infrastructure. Um, let me just real quickly, oh great, okay, I was just reading the chat window here and make sure I didn't miss anything too much. Um, yes, I will make this talk available to anybody who wants to see it. Um, so once we have the spatial risk result, we can map it onto the landscape. And if you think back to that continuum of resource objectives to protection objectives, it maps out really nicely onto a landscape. So here's the Tonto National Forest again. Those blue areas typically benefit from fire. Um, those are the wild areas that uh, need restoration for the most part. Uh, the red zones, those tend to be your uh, urban populations. And occasionally we also have things like archeological sites or uh, maybe there's um, some owl packs or other things that wouldn't benefit from fire. So those turn into little red dots on the landscape as well. So once you have a product that looks like this, where do you go with it? Um, you've got this nice continuous understanding of the risk on your landscape, and that's when we move into step two. Step two is how do you bring operations into understanding your planning risk? And for that, we're introducing this concept also that Matt Thompson coined the phrase for, and it's called Potential Wildfire Operational Delineations, or PODs for short. So I'm going to be talking about pods quite a bit in this talk. And what these pods are is a way to summarize that risk on the landscape, not just basically trying to concentrate where risk is or where risk isn't, but in such a way that it's, it's a defensible perimeter so that if you wanted to change that risk profile, you could go in there and do that with equipment, with people, with whatever you wanted to do. If you do not want to, you could maybe aggregate a bunch of these pods together and have a large fire that's affecting a large area because maybe it's going to do a lot of good on the landscape. So the idea is that depending on the point of ignition, you get this measured response that relates already to your risk profile on the landscape. And one of the things in talking to fire managers that we've been trying to push is if we can get science that backs up this idea of allowing more managed fire, allowing more fire for resource benefit, a lot of people would, would get on board with that. If they can get their leadership behind them, um, understanding that that is how you do restoration work. And so that's what some of this science is designed to do, is to allow those decisions to be made so that if conditions are right, if the risk profile is right, maybe this is the perfect time to do that managed fire. And if something goes wrong, because invariably, invariably, sometimes things do go wrong, you'll have some kind of a defensible standpoint saying that probabilistically speaking, and the outcome we were shooting for, you know, we, we had the, the right intentions and we had everything set up, and so sometimes things get away from us, but more often than not, um, we might actually see more successes coming out of a, a planning process like this. 
So the two components of these pods are this idea of planning pods. These are things that you can do in the preseason, maybe a year or two in advance. This is the kind of thing you can even load into WUFDIS a year in advance. And these are strate strategic zones that are defensible um, from a, a, a management perspective, but that uh, emphasize that long-term um, understanding of risk on the landscape. And ideally, these conceptually can kind of turn into burn blocks in the future. So you're trying to eventually, especially in your maintain and restora restoration zones, you kind of want to turn these into potential burn blocks for, to use in the future. But we, of course, understand that under any given incident, conditions change quickly. Uh, we have a lot of things that are going on at once. And so it's really important to maintain flexible information and the best available information to adapt those planning pods into something that you can actually use for an incident tailored response. So we took this concept down to the Tonto National Forest. And they were in the process of uh, mop-up on the juniper fire. Um, in June when I went down and talked to them about this new model that we were coming up with to try and predict potential opportunities for uh, management points on a given fire. Um, it was kind of a, a scientifically derived method and they said, you know, that, that sounds of interest to us. What was cool with them is they had this limited history of managing fire. Um, they have done some managed fires, but they've done a lot of uh, full suppression also and they were getting tired of it. They had seen other forests in the region doing a lot more managed fire, so they wanted to give it a shot. And so what they did was in the spring of 2016, and actually even the winter of, of 2015, they went out and walked a large area where they had put out a series of small fires over the last decade and decided that if they got another ignition in that area, they were going to let the fire come to them. They weren't going to try and send people into really steep, rugged terrain into dangerous conditions just to put out a small fire, especially in an area that needed to burn. It was an area that hadn't seen a large fire in, in several decades and an area that would really benefit from a large managed fire. So they did a lot of pre-planning. They had fuel specialists out there and they basically demarcated off this area that if they got an ignition, they were going to run with it. They were going to let this thing grow and they were going to contain it where they could contain it safely and ideally treat a whole lot of acres. And their gamble worked off beautifully. Um, they ended up with about a 31,000 acre fire in the juniper fire here. Um, and they, they tied it off exactly where they wanted to tie it off. And they used a lot of advanced ignition techniques to burn the areas that they needed to burn to, to try and keep severity low uh, and really manage that fire in an ecological way. So they were really excited about the fact that they, this had worked for them. But then they looked across the road on either side of this fire and they didn't know where to go from there. Um, there, there. There wasn't another clear-cut, easy way to do this elsewhere on the forest. So that's where our model came in. So what we did is we actually developed our model in a landscape uh, quite a ways north, up in Idaho, um, just in a very fire-dense location. And we're actually using historical fire perimeters from the Monitoring Trends and Burn Severity Database to predict where future control points are likely to happen. And so we, we basically create this, this model that uses historical fire to predict future fire. Um, here again, we're back to the Tonto National Forest. Here are those fire perimeters from the Tonto. And what we looked at is what were the conditions associated with the creation of a fire perimeter. And so on a fire perimeter, we gave that value a 1. On the interior of a fire, we gave that value a 0 saying that fire didn't stop there. On the outside of the fire, we ignored those areas because we know that fires have happened over the last 30 years that weren't recorded outside these perimeters um, and well before the last 30 years, but also uh, we don't have in our database. So we couldn't really say. We didn't want to build a model off of, off of uh, guessing, of guesswork. So we really just focused on where perimeters were and where they weren't, which is the outside and the, in, or the, the edge and the inside of a fire. And then we looked at all of the environmental conditions that we could come up with that were associated with where fire stopped and where they didn't. So we looked at topography, we looked at uh, slopes, fuel types, uh, soils, uh, different vegetation changes. Uh, we looked at the developed features, whether the roads or infrastructure, uh, natural barriers, non-burnable fuel types, um, rivers, any of those types of things that we could figure out that might be associated with where perimeters were likely to, to form.
And then, of course, we also know that there has been very active fire management on this landscape, a lot of suppression activity over the last 30 years. So we tried to bring that in using these operational response effort metrics. So Greg Dillon had two papers uh, looking at something he calls the resistance to control metric, which is basically how quickly you can cut line in certain fuel types. Um, so how efficient are you at creating new line um, given the fuel type you're dealing with? Um, Francisco Rodriguez y Silva had a paper that came out in 2014 on something he's actively working on right now called the suppression difficulty index. And that is more of a complex metric where you look at the potential for things to go wrong. So it's looking at heat intensity and flame length. You multiply those two things together, and that's your potential danger on the landscape. That's your difficulty you're dealing with. And then you can divide that in the numerator, by, or the denominator, I should say, uh, by all of the ways that you can reduce the heat intensity and the flame length. And that's by getting your resources in quickly, uh, looking at your road networks, um, looking at what resources you have available, a whole series of other metrics that he develops. And so it allows you to kind of knock down that suppression difficulty um, if you can get in there with the suppression resources that, that are available. Other things we looked at are the travel costs, just how hard it is to get from a major road to any other point on the landscape. And then we just modeled the physical rate of fire spread just using flam map, and we just chose 90 percentile fire weather conditions for this region. So we got all of these ideas about how these could be related to uh, where fire stop, and we put them all together into a model. Um, this is a, what's called a boosted regression tree model. It's basically, um, for the stats folks, it's a multivariate logistic regression that puts together these decision trees that basically wrap in as many of these variables at, at once and look at how they interact with one another and which ones are good predictors of those fire perimeters and which ones are lousy predictors of those fire perimeters. We run about 10,000 iterations of this model, and what it does is it uh, ranks and prioritizes the inputs, and then it, it cuts out all the things that don't matter. So I threw about 20 different predictors at it. It came back and said about nine of those are significant. And the first thing you'll notice here in terms of fire predictors is that it's really transportation and accessibility that on this particular landscape determine where fires are likely to stop. So if a fire slows down a little bit, if it's relatively easy to get to on foot, or especially if you can get heavy equipment into it, that suppression action is stopping fires on this landscape historically. Um, what that means that if we're looking at things like ridge lines and valleys and all these other traditional control points, in this particular landscape, if you don't have a person stationed there cutting line, the fire is going to continue burning over a ridge line. There is no timber line here. We have a lot of continuous fuels. Um, so it's a very different situation than you'd see in a lot of the more northern forests. So what we get at the end of this is this predictive probabilistic model that tells us what our chances are of a fire stopping anywhere on this landscape. So we predict to the rest of the landscape that we didn't use as our input. And what we see is the red areas have a very low chance of fire stopping on their own. And these blue areas are areas where you potentially have pretty good opportunities to get in front of a fire and change behavior if you want to. Um, what's important to notice here also, though, is that I'm just using 90th percentile fire weather for an example purpose. You can also run this using 97th percentile, 80th percentile, whatever you want to do, and that changes this map. Your opportunities change based on the fire weather conditions. Uh, when we did a, a model analysis here, we, it turned out we got about 80% accuracy on the predicted fire perimeter locations versus where they actually landed on the landscape, and we left some data out. So we had some pretty high confidence this model is working pretty well. So the next thing we did was took it down to the forest. And for three days, I went out with a fuel specialist, and I drove around for th for, uh, through all parts of the forest, and we basically loaded my model into a GPS and drove around inside of it and looked at where the model said we'd have success and where we wouldn't and tried to figure out if there were rough spots that weren't working, why that was. Um, the important thing to note also was this model was developed off of data up to 2012. So we didn't have the most recent fuels, we didn't have the most recent fires or fuel treatments. So I went back to the office after this field validation and we updated all of the fuel treatments the forest had been through, uh, added the new fire perimeters, re-ran the fire simulations, um, did all that kind of stuff. And in the end, it kicks out this atlas of all the possibilities 
for control locations. Blue areas, again, are good opportunities. Red areas, not so good. But what we wanted to do is figure out how to chunk that down so that you can actually create these polygons of risk on the landscape. So to do that, you just basically take your best opportunities and leave the rest behind. And so from a planning perspective, that's what you, we see here, is you're prioritizing these yellow areas as the best spots, green areas as second best, and then you have certain areas where you just don't have a way to complete your polygon, so you have to eventually create line or do something um, to allow yourself to, to form these complete polygons. So repeating that 2016 single fire process, this is what the model tells us should have happened with uh, 2016 fires retrospective. They didn't have this information at the time, but the model says, you know that, that left side of the fire, the western flank was a, an awesome control point, and your next best opportunity was on that uh, northeast flank, and that's exactly what they used. Um, the southern edge of the fire, it actually burned out in a fuel transition type, um, and, or fuel type transition, I should say. Um, so they didn't ever build line along the southern edge of the, the fire, and the model shows that the uh, fire would likely slow down and become um, basically hung up in some of those fuel types as it got further south. So the model did a pretty good job of capturing what they actually did. And so what we did is then worked with the forest to figure out how to transfer that model and make it forest-wide. Uh, use that process they came up with in 2016 and apply it to the rest of their forest. So we brought our model in. Uh, we broke it out by ranger district, had the fuels and fire planners for each ranger district look at the opportunities on the forest that they knew very well. We also brought in line officers and resource specialists, the wildlifers, the hydrologists, everybody in so that we could kind of get everyone on the same page in terms of language. And we looked at the opportunities that they thought were the best on the landscape and chunked out their landscape with them. We let them do all the work, um, and then we did all the GIS heavy lifting to, to turn it into some shape files. So basically what we did is we start with this network of all the possibilities, and then we chunk it out into um, these pod networks. You'll notice some areas, uh, like in the northern part of the Tonto Forest here, we have a bunch of these tiny pods. That's because those are areas that have a lot of these highly valued resources and assets. They, there's these urban populations. You want as many opportunities as possible to stop a fire where you might need to. Um, the larger pods you see on this landscape, those are areas where either there's very little opportunity to stop a fire, or maybe that's a wilderness, uh, or another area where, generally speaking, you want those fires to burn as big as they can, because they're just doing good. They're just treating the area. They're restoring your watersheds. They're doing a lot of good things. So the, the size of these pods oftentimes is uh, associated with how they're expected to be used. So once you have this risk product on the left here, how do you combine that with your defensible locations? Well, you put the two together, you get something that looks a bit like this. Um, and again, it's pretty ugly, so you've got to summarize it down. So with that, you can actually summarize by what are your positive values. Those blue areas are likely to result in positive benefits. When you have negative values, um, it's super negative values are red, moderately negative, have an opportunity for restoration. And then interestingly, on the Tonto, we also run into these purple areas where the Sonoran Desert is currently being invaded by African grasses. So they're going to try and exclude fire from those locations where they can, understanding that it's not worth risking firefighters' lives, and there aren't people out there, um, but that, generally speaking, these are not areas where you want to be doing any controlled burning or that kind of stuff because it's a, it's a Sonoran Desert system. And then lastly, I'll draw your attention to the orange spots. These would be high-complexity zones, and I'll get into those a little bit more, but those were kind of head-scratchers for the whole forest, and that, that was going to have to start the dialogue with the people living in those areas about what really needs to be done next for those places. So. What we end up with is a map that looks like this. We have now identified some of the strategic response objectives. Once you get an ignition, what's your first idea of how you might want to deal with a fire, whether you're likely to move towards containing that fire relatively small, or if you're likely to look at your fire weather, decide to treat that as a restoration area, um, or if you're likely to just maintain fire. I'll draw your attention also to this area. I'm not sure if you can see it very well. Um, this big green kind of upside down heart shaped area in the center, that is the juniper fire area. And when we ran our initial analysis in 2012, that was a yellow area. We converted it to green. So we converted it from restore to maintain 
by burning it. Uh, with the idea being the more we burn it, the more likely it's going to stay as a maintain area. So we've already got fire back in that system. But what's nice with this now is we have a communications tool. This is a way that we can engage the public and talk about the fire response objectives and how they align with the long-term landscape plan. You can discuss the values at risk. You can look at the desired fire response. Um, and it also allows you to identify areas where you're going to need to change something. And that's when we get back to these orange areas. These orange areas here um, are the areas where we don't have a clear-cut response because those pods are too big or there's just no way to mitigate the risk inside there. So we've got to figure out if we need to do uh, cut new fuel lines, uh, do something so that we can create smaller pods that we can uh, reclassify maybe as a restoration pod or a protect pod or something along those lines. The reason that these are orange right now is that there's no safe way to get in and manage fire in these locations. You can't just suppress because there's no way to, you're not comfortable putting people in there. At the same time, you often have values at risk that you care about that are likely to be negatively affected by fire. And under the right weather conditions, you could have some very positive restoration burns going on. So we're still kind of calling those the wait and see pods this year, the idea being that those need to be changed for next year um, through uh, actual management actions. So how does this all map onto true incident response? What's cool about this concept is that these strategic response zones that we've created and the pod building blocks that, they, that are, they're made up of, that fits directly into spatial fire planning as it's uh, defined by the U.S. Forest Service. So well, that actually allows us to create that link between the forest plan, which is that risk-based component, and the operational fire management component. So if we look at the way WUFDIS was handling the Tonto National Forest last year before we had all this stuff implemented, you can see the management objectives are all based by ranger district. And so we have each of these ranger districts with a whole bunch of redundant uh, objectives. And so if you look on here, pretty ugly, but if you look at these, like J or D or C, those are the actual management objectives. The numbers are just tied to the ranger district. And so we have redundant objectives repeated over and over and over all over the forest. We were able to take something like that and instead map our pods directly onto it and then summarize all those objectives so that it's the same objective for the same letter anywhere in the forest. It's not tied to a ranger district. Spatially, that doesn't matter. Ownership is the forest, it's not the district. And so that allows us to start to summarize and simplify the response. Um, here's another example looking at an actual ignition. If we could imagine running a, an ignition through WUFDIS um, using this system, here we have an ignition in uh, the mountains near Globe. And immediately you can see that we can, we've already uploaded our pod network. And so when you have that ignition, we have three pods that already make up a uh, potential um, planning zone. Uh, whether you decide to make that bigger or smaller, of course, would de depend on what your objectives are for that particular location. Here, all of these pods are in a restore zone. Um, that's your strategic response here is restore, and so if the, if the weather's correct for that, um, that, that enables you to allow a fire to spread under those conditions. Uh, what you're looking at here is a 14-day FS Pro run um, that shows that chances are this fire is going to be maintained within those uh, three pods uh, for the, at least the next two weeks and possibly longer um, given the, the, the weather forecast. What's nice is that this is, there is no optimized single solution. Um, you still have a lot of flexibility. You can keep changing where these pods overlay, and I'll show that a little bit more. Um, but if you wanted to look at pod 115, this is where that ignition started, and you're wondering why it has that funny shape to it, well, I just pulled up the MTBS fire perimeters, and sure enough, a lot of the reason the shape of this pod looks the way it does is there are fires from 2011, from 2009, and from the year 2000 that determine where this, this pod boundary is. And so you're likely to get a hang up of a fire when it hits these, these old burn scars anyway. So that gives you a, a pretty nice view there of why the pod looks the way it does. But you could also imagine that if you had a situation like this and you wanted to go in and say, you know what? We've got too many values at risk inside this pod. We can't burn this whole thing out. How do we go in and look at other opportunities on the inside of this pod? Well, for that, you go back to your potential control location atlas. So here's that same pod, 115, right here and right here. Oops, there it is. 
Um, and I've, I've highlighted it right here. Inside that pod, you can see that we also have potentially a ridge line uh, right in this area. That is a, another potential control opportunity that looks pretty good. Um, where the fire is actively burning right now, there really aren't any opportunities. Um, also on the, uh, like on the east side of the fire, again, we've got an area that probably you're not going to be able to stop fire, but if you wait until you get all the way out here to the edge of pod 116, there's your next real opportunity that's out there. So it allows you to communicate both internally to your fire staff about why you're making the decisions you're making. Um, and you can override this model, of course, if you have better data. Um, but it also allows you to communicate with the public where your opportunities are and why you're putting people at risk or not uh, based on the conditions on the ground. What's also really cool about this, I already touched on this before, is that here I'm just using the perimeter probability at 90th percentile fire weather. Say you're managing this as a managed fire because you've got 80th percentile conditions, your map would change. You'd actually see a lot more opportunities at 80th percentile than you see at 90th. Uh, conversely, if you're in the peak of fire season, 97th percentile fire conditions, a lot of those opportunities disappear. And then you really have to fall back to the best control points that you can identify. So uh, where that leaves us is fire season 2017. And tomorrow, I ship out for the Tonto to be a technical specialist uh, on the fire that I was just showing right here. Um, this is the Pinal fire. Um, this is the actual ignition location of the Pinal fire and some FS Pro runs that I just ran this week um, to get a sense of where that fire is likely to be going over the next two weeks. So I'll be heading down to the Pinal fire to provide some input um, for customizing the, the fuel, or sorry, the uh, the, the fire weather modeling components, but for me it's also going to be a big learning experience. Um, I want to see how decisions are being made and w if this is a useful tool or if there's something we need to be doing differently to make this a better tool for managers to use. Um, another exciting thing that we have coming up is uh, we have a, a scientist here, Matt Reeves, who's developed something called the Rangeland Vegetation Simulator. And what that's able to do is use uh, a three or a four month old weather stream to grow the, the fine surface fuels, the one hour fuels that are really important for fire spread in the southwest and update the land fire surface fuel models so that when you go to run your simulations, you're actually looking at the, the big uh, El Nino events of last year or the year before where you had tons of rain and now you have tons of herbaceous fuels on the ground. In land fires native format, you're usually two to four years behind on the fuels. In Matt's new product, um, you'll be two months behind, which gives you a much better snapshot. So we're hoping to implement that also on the, on the uh, Tonto, if we can get that up and running. And we'll just have to see how it goes. And uh, this is an experiment. Tonto is a, a, a willing participant in it, and I'm pretty excited, and they're pretty excited. So we're just going to have to see where it goes from here. Um, just real quickly, some parting thoughts also. This is a suite of tools. Um, it's, well, all we're trying to do is provide new and better information for decision makers. We're not telling anybody what to do. And everything that we've produced here requires interpretation by an incident commander, by those line officers, by the people who are actually making the fire decisions so that they can generate the best possible plan. And they can take or leave data with, within it. We're not trying to tell anybody what to do but we're trying to enable them so that they have the best decision uh, surface basically that they can work from. So that's what I have, and I'd be happy to entertain some questions. Great. Well, thank you so much, Kit. Uh, fascinating presentation, and um, it's really neat to hear you're headed out tomorrow to kind of um, take it to the next level. Uh, we have had some questions come in. Uh, Gene Rogers email or texted in and asked whether aviation assets were factored into the analysis and highlighting that ease of access was identified for, for success probability. Yeah, so we had some trouble dealing with the aviation component um, in the initial formulation of the suppression difficulty index. Uh, suppression resources are figured in, but they use things like distance to um, water pickup sites and um, aviation turnaround times. That's something that if we had that information on an individual incident, we could figure it in 
and um, that could potentially alter the, the outcome of the model. Um, one of the things that was kind of cool um, that we found with the Juniper Fire, and I'm going to just pull up this slide for the Juniper Fire real quick if I can find it. Um, There we go. So if we pull up the Juniper fire here, um, our model results showed that there's this section of the Juniper fire um, in the lower left-hand corner that's likely to be a trouble spot. There's a road where they can stop the fire, but there's red on either side, which means fire is going to spread quickly and potentially with some intensity on either side of the road. The forest had already identified that as the only real trouble spot that they knew about on the forest, and so they used that location for retardant drops. And that's the only retardant drops that were made on the Juniper for fire. And it was on the uh, west side of the road. Uh, they wanted the east side of the road to burn up to the road. And then they actually had firefighters standing in there as soon as the retardant had dropped to catch any spots that jumped over. Um, and so this can be used to prioritize where you'd want to use some of those aviation resources. Um, but we don't have it specifically figured into the probability of, of uh, perimeter forming or not, just because uh, at the moment um, it's really tough to nail down how those aviation resources are likely to be used. Great, thanks. Um, let me see if I can accurately read Daniel Godwin's question. Have you tried training the regression trees on smaller data sets, i.e. forests with lower densities of perimeters? So that is the new frontier. Uh, we are actively building up our database of landscapes to test this onto. Um, one thought is that if we can develop a model on a relatively characteristic type of landscape, we could just transfer that model onto an area that has a similar type of topography, a similar type of, uh, of fire response, without having to rely on the historical fire perimeters to build the model. So we might be able to have some transferability of the model to other landscapes. That's something that we're working on, and the idea of kind of developing these regional models as opposed to forest-specific models, uh, and that's coming with our scripting right now. We've got two tech specialists who are putting this together into a much more user-friendly interface than I ever developed, and uh, that will allow us to scale up and test some of those questions. And so that, that's a, definitely a question we're interested in, and hopefully in the next several months we'll have a better answer. Great. Uh, then Kurt had a question. This tool requires that forests have already established historic range of variability, HVRAs. Uh, that, right? Those are values and assets. Oh, sorry. Values yeah. and assets. Hi, values. Um, in your experience, do most forests have them already identified? And what can they do if they don't already have these values identified? Um, so they have to be identified. That's the only way this works. In order to understand the risk to the system, you've got to understand what it is you care about on the forest and how it's likely to respond to fire. Um, most of the forests that we have worked with already know what's out there on their landscape um, and that, that they care about. Um, what's been a little harder is getting individual forests to put a number on what the response of fire is likely to be. Um, and so that's a, a series of workshops we've been holding with forests over the last uh, about four and a half or five years. Um, Jess Haas, the second author on this uh, presentation, has been doing a ton of work with these workshops where you get your line officers and your resource specialists to sit down and look at the things that matter uh, politically, typically for the line officers, and ecologically for those resource specialists and have them really think about how fire is likely to affect those things, say, at a two-foot flame length or at a four-foot flame length. And so you can create those response functions when you just kind of put your heads together. What we've been doing, uh, what the Forest Service um, has been doing from a research perspective is each region now has, I believe, already taken on um, creating these HVRA um, weighting System. So there, there are now regional products for each of at least the western forest regions. Um, what we've also found is that each individual forest oftentimes wants to reweight those things or wants to add in other things. And we think that's great if they have the, the time and energy to do that. If they don't, 
they can fall back on these regional pro these regional products that are already out there. Great. And um, while we're waiting, if, in case somebody else types in another question, I'll ask one, and that is, uh, what's the opportunity to take this out someday in the future towards an all lands, all hands kind of vision and extend beyond the, the Forest Service boundaries? Well, I'm glad you brought that up because um, a week and a half ago, I gave uh, a similar talk to the Cohesive Strategy Workshop in Reno, Nevada, specifically focused on how we're developing this with National Forests just because uh, they're, they're the easy, willing partners, and they're internal to us because we are Forest Service, so they're easy for us to get to. But um, the idea being that when we get to – let me just pull up um, – what am I – yeah, so, for example, if you look just at um, these pods, you'll notice that they don't actually – on the left side of this image – that's the actual outline of the Tonto National Forest with these hard lines and a bunch of strange shapes. Um, if you look at, on the right side over here, you have these much more organic kind of features that are actually based around potential control locations. And so that means that we're slopping over onto BIA land, we're slopping over onto state land and onto some municipal land. And so what that does is it starts the conversation with those surrounding landowners saying, look, we don't have an opportunity to stop a fire at our own jurisdictional border, but we do have an opportunity if you want to get together with us to kind of harden these lines on your land. And so that if you don't want fire on your land, we'll have to come onto your land a little bit to stop a fire, but this is what it would look like. Conversely, with BIA, for example, they're very interested in having more fire on their land. And so they're already talking about, well, how do we take that pod network and extend it out over our whole landscape? Um, north of the Tantra National Forest is the Apache Sea Graves. They saw this presentation and said, when are you going to come to us and so that we can start our pod so that we have a continuous pod landscape for the Tonto and the Apache Sea Graves? So that's the idea is we're trying to kind of knit this together um, in a way that it becomes a landscape system, not a, an ownership system. Great. And uh, Susan typed in a question, in an all-lands landscape, the values at risk may be weighted differently by different interest groups. I'm sure Absolutely. they are. Uh, Absolutely. What about using these different methods where collaborative groups identify uh, HVRAs but don't weigh them? Well, so we have an experiment going on right now with that up in Montana. Uh, the Lewis and Clark County – um, has part of the Beaverhead Deer Lodge Forest on it, the Helena National Forest, um, and then several municipalities in the county. And what we're trying there is we think that the response functions for the things we care about, those are science-based or based on our best understanding of the ecology of the system, so they're not likely to change. But ex exactly as Helen just mentioned, it's the weighting of those things. Um, that, that changes. And so what we're doing right now is allowing each ownership to change the weighting on their system. And so as soon as you cross over that border, you might see some kind of distinct changes in risk because maybe the timber industry has a lot more clout on that land than on this land, or um, maybe it, there's, there's some other thing that is driving the, the response. So right now we're allowing each of the ownerships to determine their weighting and understanding that when you knit it all together, it might make some interesting boundaries, but we haven't tried it yet, so we're going to see. Um, otherwise, telling people what their priorities should be or just holding everything equal, uh, both of those could be pretty sticky, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, so Ed asks, are forests using these HVRA values to justify fuel treatments around values to change the nature of the pods, uh, which can change the suppression strat strategies and tactics? Absolutely, and that is the intention. And that's actually one thing that we're struggling with right now is this idea of that color scheme that I put together here. That is supposed to be dynamic. The idea being that if you're doing the restoration treatments that you want to be doing and you're using fire and you're doing controlled burns and you're actually going out and doing active fuel treatments, a bunch of these yellow areas, eventually you can turn green. And conversely, some of those red areas where you just don't have any good options right now, once they get a little bit of fire in them, they might turn yellow. 
understanding also that as you have urban encroachment or maybe you identified a new species, a fire sensitive species, you might see the opposite direction happen. So maybe some of your red areas, your yellow areas are going to turn red, or unfortunately maybe some of your green areas are going to turn a different color also. So what we're, what we're struggling with right now, um, it's pretty easy to do this in, within WOFDIS to make this dynamic. And so you can recharacterize those strategic response zones based on the, the current risk. Getting that into a paper document in such a way that the strategic responses themselves don't change, but how they map onto the landscape does, that's the challenge. So we're, we're working on that right now. Um, I have a partner uh, down in Region 5 in the Southern Sierras who is kind of pioneering the plan writing side of this. And she and I have been trying to put our heads together to figure out how best to insert this dynamic language into plans. So that's something I'll be working on over the next month or two. Great. Well, we've, we've kept everybody a little bit over time, um, but it, clearly that shows the interest level on this topic. And Kit, I really want to thank you. You did a great job in presenting what I felt was a pretty complex uh, set of ideas in a way that uh, was easy to understand. So thank you for taking the time and, and providing such a great presentation. Thank you. I really appreciate having an audience, and I apologize for my motor mouth. <laughs> no, it went, went really smoothly. And um, we will share a recording of this, um, and we'll work to get uh, some version of the PowerPoint uh, out to folks uh, as well. So thanks, everybody, and uh, look forward to having you join me on future webinars. But thanks for participating today. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.